but propelling a full tanker is more than a little challenging. Fully laden, this tanker weighs 113,000 tons. Once underway, it takes an hour to bring it to a complete standstill. But how do you get it going in the first place? You might expect a modern vessel to be driven by a complicated computer system with some very fancy mechanisms. Well, you'd be right about the computers, but the mechanisms are a different matter. At the heart of this vast tanker, there is, not surprisingly, a vast engine. It's immensely powerful, making 30,000 horsepower, in fact, to drive the ship across the seas round the world. It's very clever, it's very high-tech, but inside it's based on a principle that was first used hundreds of years ago. Tens of hundreds, in fact. Meet the 2,000-year-old Aeoli pile, or as it's more commonly known, Hero's Engine, after the Greek scientist who invented it. Here's how it works. In the base here is a reservoir of water. What I'm going to do is heat that water up, thus. When you heat the water, it turns to steam. This bit goes on top, so the steam rises up here. And now, the only way out for the steam is through tiny, tiny holes in the ends of these nozzles here. Then it all gets a bit Newtonian, because when the steam comes out that way, it exerts an equal and opposite reaction, a push that way, and sets the top spinning. What we're going to do now is wait for it to build up pressure. There wasn't much to be doing in those days, obviously, so waiting for things was great. Do some philosophy while we wait, perhaps. You might think this spinning pot is simply a toy, but no, this same principle was used by the ancient Greeks in a machine to open temple doors. Fast forward a couple of thousand years and steam transforms the world, powering industry and transport. And then steam engines went the way of top hats, and now we think of them as yesterday's machines. But in a safely remote, muddy field, I set out to learn what the engineers of liquid gas tankers know very well. Steam is powerful. You just need to put it under pressure. The more, the better. I've brought steam engine specialist Richard Gibbon, Gibbo, along to demonstrate steam's true potential, or with a bomb. We're going to put water in this super strong container buried in the mud. Steam from the traction engine will heat the water. Normally, it would boil, turn into gas, and escape, just as it does from your kettle. But that shiny lid prevents the water from turning to steam because it can't expand. There isn't room. Instead, the pressure inside will simply get higher and higher until it explodes. So this whole setup, Richard, is all about the power of steam. Now, I'll be honest, I think steam... Oh, I mean, look at that sweet old thing. It's from the past. And you've got this little pot in the ground here and a pipe. Is steam that powerful? Yes, it is. And there's a massive amount of energy locked up in water that is changing to steam. And, and that's what this experiment's going to demonstrate. Um, Richard, what's the shed for? Uh, the shed's just to demonstrate that steam has a lot of force, power, energy. So you're going to break this shed, I guess? Hope so. Even well above its normal boiling point, the water won't turn to steam until the pressure is released when the lid bursts off. Then it will expand instantaneously, creating an explosion. First, though, the sacrificial shed. Nobody walk on the big disc. How many crack engineers does it take to move a garden shed? Quite a lot, it seems. Then, even then, they managed to break it. I don't know, has anybody seen a steam bomb? Well, we've never done this before. It's new. It's going well, this. With the soon-to-be X shed in place, we fired up the boilers and Richard opened the valve to pump steam into our underground kettle. 
Okay. Slightly more. Our steam bomb is ticking, and now all we can do is wait. As the metal kettle gets hotter, you can see the puddles around it boil and turn into steam. But the water inside, although it's well above boiling point, can't turn into steam until the lid blows off. Yep. It's moving. Yes, it's moving. The pressure gauge needle slowly ticked up. Gibbo expected it to blow at around 5.5 bar, which is five and a half times atmospheric pressure. Boiling muddy puddles make the shed steam like a finished sauna. The kettle lid starts to buckle under the mounting pressure. I think we should be at the bridge. We retreated. Six and a half. And now we really are into unknown territory. Come up to seven. Properly dangerous now. Any more, and we'll be close to running out of steam. The traction engine can only handle 10 bar, and if that lets go. That went. Brilliant. What did that reach? Seven and a half bar. That's, so, and the shed is no more. The simple power of boiling water had given our shed an extreme steam clean and completely obliterated it. The vessel itself was fine, while the lid had been blown off. There's the discs. Yeah. And you can't really see, but the vessel is empty and dry. Every single bit of water turned yes. instantly to steam and therefore expanded massively. So it's just false. Sorry about your shed. You, you've ruined it. Yeah. Yeah, steam is perhaps more powerful than I thought. And it's that same steam power that drives giant liquid gas carriers through the world's oceans. As you might expect, everything about these tankers puts our mini steam bomb to shame. This is also a pressure vessel, like the one I used to clean my shed, only it is a bit bigger. And there are two of them. And these are generating high-pressure steam all day, every day. So although in some ways this whole engine room looks a bit inert, a bit inactive, it's actually generating and containing incredible quantities of energy and power all the time. Compared to 140 degrees in our pressure kettle in the shed, the steam here is at 510 degrees, and the pressure is eight times higher. Mark Hodgson manages a liquid gas tanker fleet. He puts the power produced by those two massive containers into perspective. They're just boilers making steam. And uh, together they produce 110 tonnes an hour. That is equivalent to about an Olympic-sized swimming pool is processed by these units every day. And that steam pressure and temperature is delivered downstairs to the turbine. All right, so steam made here in big boilers. Steam goes downstairs to the turbine, and this is where Hero's engine comes in. So the same principle that turned Hero's engine powers these monster tankers. It turns the propeller. It also provides all of the electricity for every single appliance on board, right down to the crew's TV. On these ships, the secret of harnessing power from steam lies in their turbines. Mark shows me the amazingly simple machine that generates the ship's electricity. Its lid was off, and you could see the hundreds of turbine blades that the steam physically turns. OK, so steam comes in that end? Yes. And then what? As the steam is injected at each stage, 
This is where you get the rotational forces applied to the rotor itself. So this is where it starts to turn the whole thing. So there's an immense amount of force going through here, which rather explains the enormous stud bolts here, because the pressure contained within this when it's up and running is huge. It's a large casing, has to contain 60 bar steam. There is such a thing as a beautiful simplicity, and this, this incredibly clever device has one moving part. The engine that drives this entire ship has one moving part, this, turned by steam. You wouldn't want to catch your tie in it, would you? Not really. <laughs> this turbine is powerful, but the one that drives this ship delivers seven and a half times more power. The steam made in the boilers drives the turbine over there behind me. That comes through to the gearbox, and from the gearbox is transferred to the propeller shaft there. And then out there at the stern of the ship, the propeller shaft turns the propeller itself. At that point, it bites into the water and shoves forward with incredible force. These tankers are designed to be super efficient. They cannibalize their own cargo to produce steam. And for the 25 tons of water they consume every day, they turn to the surrounding ocean. But salt water is horribly corrosive. And the crew just refuse to drink it, softies. So all the seawater is boiled and evaporated to remove the salt. And once again, it's steam that does the work. But to make it even more efficient, calls for a principle noted by the father of evolution, naturalist Charles Darwin. Investigating wildlife in the Andes Mountains, Darwin noticed something that plagues all mountaineers who try to boil potatoes. They take ages to cook. Darwin put it down to altitude, and he was right. We learn that water boils at 100 degrees C, but as Darwin noticed, the boiling point varies if you're up a mountain. The potatoes were taking longer to cook because at altitude, air pressure is lower, so water boils at a lower temperature. The boiling water just wasn't hot, and you can't cook potatoes in cold water. You can even boil water without heating it at all if you reduce atmospheric pressure enough. Right, switch the pump on. That is sucking the air out of there. That's lowering the pressure. This is to prove that water will boil at a lower temperature at lower pressure. So, my marshmallow man is to prove... See? That's a vacuum in there. As you can see, marshmallows expand in low pressure. Useful to know. Yeah, it's, it's grisly, sorry. But the point here is not to prove what happens to marshmallow men in low pressure, albeit quite funny. So what happens to water? Actually, this is just like taking it up to high altitude where the pressure's lower. But obviously, this is easier. In fact, the pressure in the jar is the equivalent of being at 85,000 feet, almost three times the height of Mount Everest. I think I can see some bubbles at the bottom. Remember, I'm introducing no heat here. It's just a room temperature, and this room is at a very low temperature. And there it goes. Now, it's not just splashing about for the fun of it. That water is boiling. And that's not because I've introduced any more heat to it. That's just because I've lowered the pressure. Right, and so I'll now prove that it really is just at room temperature. Air flooding back in, pressure coming back up. Sorry, Marshmallow Man. Bad day. The point being, room temperature, in fact, really very cold, but boiling away happily. I mean, you wouldn't want to make a cup of tea with it, but point, I think, is proved. So, boiling doesn't mean water reaches 100 degrees. It simply means it turns from liquid to gas, which it does at different temperatures, according to pressure. And on this ship, just as I did in my vacuum flask, they boil water at a low temperature by reducing the pressure. Once again, they harness steam. But they reverse the high pressure process. 
when you make water expand quickly into steam. You make low pressure by going back the other way, condensing steam rapidly into water. You need something called a flash condenser, and I'm going to build my own. One barrel to start off with, so that goes... On board, they use leftover steam from the engines, but I need to rustle up my own. So, first, add a little water. Apply heat. Gas on. Wait, and wait, and wait. And, hey presto. Right, finally, we've got steam. So, very quickly, I've got to remove the heat and seal it. Quickly as I can. So, heat comes out, lid goes on. I've got to really seal it because it's important no air can get in. That's sealed. Right, it's full of steam. What I'm going to do now is condense that steam back into water quickly. Here's the way. Right. Cold water will flash condense the steam, reducing the pressure. You can hear it creaking and groaning. As that steam condenses back into water, it shrinks, lowers the pressure in there. And the outside of the barrel still has to stand up, remember, to atmospheric pressure pushing in. Ooh. Yep. That's what happens when you lower the pressure inside. There was no way for air to get in to build the pressure up again. Atmospheric pressure was too much, and bang, it collapsed. Liquid gas carriers instantly turn steam back to water using flash condensation. And that creates a low pressure area, like my vacuum jar, in which they boil seawater at just 50 degrees C. They don't bother with the marshmallows. That was just my idea. Thanks to a principle noted by the father of evolution, gas tankers save a huge amount of energy and energy is the precious cargo these ships deliver. This is not some fuel-wasting monster carrying a ticking bomb. This giant ship is a smart and self-sufficient recycling plant. It takes all the water it needs from the ocean. It generates its own electricity and its own cargo powers it day and night around the globe.